Well, hello, people. We're going to do something a little different today. We're going to do a little lead-in hand to another hand, and they're both against Tom Dwan, and these both happen on High Stakes Poker, which you can watch exclusively on Poker Go. Now, in order to do so, you need a Poker Go subscription, and if you've been watching these videos, you already have one. But for those of you that don't, you got to get one. I'm, this isn't like debatable. This is just a must. You got to spend that money. What is it? Like 80, 90 bucks for the entire year. And you're going to get so much value out of that. You know, you can take all these different, you know, people, oh, what poker book should I get? Poker Go. That's the poker book you want because it's video. It's the full extensive library of all the high rollers. And of course, entertaining shows like high stakes poker. So make sure to do that. All right. Both these hands against Tom Dwan from the last episode that we played. The blind's 500, 1,000 with a 1,000 big blind Annie. Uh, that's that's the norm in this session, and I'm sitting on 406,000 to start this hand. Tom Dwander 226. Okay, so this is a small hand, but I, I there, there's a couple key you know um, strategic thoughts that I want you to understand about it, right? Because not every hand is this big monster riverbed all in. You know, there's a lot of intricacies to the game, and this one uh, there's something specific I wanted to share. So back with that great necklace. Daniel's gonna raise to 2,500. 2,500. All these shows seem to start out, everybody's quiet. Yeah. Dwan's gonna three bet to 12,000. Daniel calls. As you said, as I said, I raised to 2,500 on the button with two sixes. Six of spades, six of clubs. Tom from the small blind, three bets to 12,000 with the ace jack. Totally standard from here. I call. Sixes isn't a hand you want to really four bet with. Not, you know, if you're going to four bet here, you do it with some bluffy type hands. But sixes is just a really good spot here at this stack depth with, you know, we're effective 226 big blinds deep because that's what Tom's stack is. So in, at that stack depth, six is just a slam dunk. You, you, like, you're in, you like this spot. Like this is a good thing, right? Because if you flop a six... Um, you know, and he does have a big pair or something, you could potentially win yourself uh, a large sum of money. Okay. Little look from Tom. Not much on the flop. No ace, no jack, no six. Fifteen. Tom bets 15,000. And Mr. Negrano is not done with this hand as yet. So now the flop comes. Queen, deuce, four, two diamonds. Not the best flop in the world. Also not the worst flop in the world, right? With two sixes, when you are playing pairs in these spots, the fact that the deuce and the four are under cards is very, very good, right? There's only one over card. So that queen connects to ace, queen, king, queen, some queen, jack, queen, ten, queen, nine, suited, queen, eight, suited. Like, that's pretty much it for queens. I don't think he's the queen four off type guy. That's, we leave, leave that special fan for one special fucking individual. Okay, so, so it's not the worst flop in the world, right? And, and if I do call on this flop, especially against decent size, that's going to freeze him a decent amount of the time, okay? So he bets 15,000, which is pretty big, right? 15 into 26. So he's betting, you know, close to two-thirds pot. Um, again, at the stack depths, in position, uh, it's too early to fold your hand. You're getting too good of a price with the sixes, I think. But you, but you really, you realize and you understand, it's like it's going to be very difficult to win this pot because almost assuredly there's going to be an overcard on the turn, you know. And you know if it's a ten jack queen or ten jack king ace, you're pretty much cooked. Like it's hard for you to continue if he bets again. Okay. Juan's probably saying if Daniel has a queen, he's not going to like that king. Or if he has an underpair like he has, he's definitely not going to like the king. 
So since I'm Tom Dwan, here I go. 37,000. A king, a king is gonna be for you. Other cards for me, this one's you. Take it. Good for you, not good for me. <laughs> yeah. King, you good all right? for you. I'm all right. I had an idea when that king came off, it was good for me. It was good for you. You yeah. good? I'm good. You might have got you might have got three streets. Oh, maybe it was bad for you. <laughs> if you, if you no, were, it was, it was good, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, nope. JRB? Where is JRB? Where is he? I needed that king, and I needed you to not like it. <laughs> yeah, of yeah. <laughs> both of those things have to be true. <laughs> it was still good for me. It gave me, you know, gave me a chance for you to not like it. Yeah. So now the pot is fifty-six thousand, and the turn is the king of spades. And I'll tell you what, he bet thirty-seven thousand. And part of my gut is like, this is some bullshit. I really felt like it's bullshit. But this is something you learn when you mess around with solvers and stuff. One of the things you can do when you play with solvers is, you can sort of input any card like in a certain spot and say like, who's, who, who's that better for, right? The king smashes him, smashes his range, doesn't help me, right? Because when I call a big bet on the flop, having a king in my hand is very unlikely. Why? Because the only real king I'm gonna have is king queen. There's a queen out there, so that leaves three queens and four, so there's 12 combos of king queen I could possibly have. That's not a lot. And what other king high combos do I have? Sure, I have some king X of diamonds, like king 10 of diamonds, king jack. But overall, his three betting range has all the ace king, right? You know, king queen, king jack, king 10. So because of the aggressive way that he played the hand, he sort of defined my range a little more than he did his. His range can still be quite wide. The king is more likely to improve his hand than it is mine. So he bet the turn and I was like, I, I know I'm screwed here, but... With sixes here, two black sixes, I didn't even have the six of diamonds in my hand. There's not a lot I can do, right? He had a lot of outs anyway. He had the ace jack, and he made a complete, he made a perfectly standard good play with the ace jack. He has to bet that card, and he did a smart thing by betting it with size. Because even if I do call, again, he can catch the ace, the jack, the ten, which is you know ten outs. That's that's a decent amount of outs. So for me, it becomes an easy fold. But I'll tell you what, I was suspicious, you know. Um, but at the same time, you know. That king's just really bad. If the turn was like an eight, and he bets again, I may call. I may, I may, I may gamble. I may take a shot. But with the king, there's probably other than an ace. If he bets, a king is the second worst card, obviously. So I didn't like the king, and I folded. And good for him. You know, he won a little pot with the bluff skate. But I get my revenge. Okay. In this other hand we talk about with Tom, I'm sitting on 462,000. He's got 305, so again, very deep. No, no, nothing, nothing bad, but he just like <laughs> clearly was tilted and was steaming. And then it, like he caught himself, you know, to his credit. But <laughs> For no money game? Yeah. yeah. He was just like, oh, my God, funny. you know? And then <laughs> yeah, once in a tournament, he stood up and, and he started yelling. They do it every time, and he's pointing at me, and I'm like, I guess I'm they. I raise it up from middle position. To 2,500, my standard at this at this I usually come in for 2.5 with the A7 of clubs. Okay, nothing special here. Tom calls in the in position with the 8.5 of diamonds. He'll do that, right? Now it's probably not. I mean, at this stack depth, it's probably fine. But he's a loosey goosey guy. Now I'm, I wouldn't recommend. It's not the best play available, right? He's trying to play. It's a TV cash game. I get it. But you should be folding the 8.5 of diamonds here. It's just too far apart. 8.7 of diamonds. 8.6 of diamonds can probably you know, justify calling, but 8-5 is a little too far. Whatever. He's loosey-goosey. He's going to play. We also get a straggler from the big blind with the queen jack. So now there's 9K in the pot. You know, oh, when you made the it was club. really funny. Juan's flopped the best hand with eights. Dan's got there the nut go, flush yeah. draw. But he was really, really good with the troops. Like, really yeah. nice. Yeah. Stuff, but he did get tilted when he got sucked out on that hand. It's funny because with, with recreational players, they're always asking me, what about this Phil Helmet? How's he, how is he? I said, I actually really like the guy. I think, you know, he gets a little carried away and does a little berating, but, uh, but he's actually a really good dude. And, and, and the flop is king of diamonds, eight of clubs, six of clubs. So, of course, first of all, you know, Manon checks, so it's up to me. And I have the nut flush drop. So what do you do when you flop the nut, nut flush drop? What do you do in this spot on the king high board, king eight six, when you flop the nut flush drop? What is the correct play? You bet, right? You bet, okay? You always bet, or do you, okay? You bet, you bet often. 
But here's the thing. If you always bet, you're not flush draw. If you always bet, you're not flush draw. Okay? When you check in these spots, when you, you know, or just basically any flush draw, right? If you always bet your flush draws, when you check and a flush comes, you've just eliminated for your opponent an entire section of your range that you can't have anymore, right? And you don't want to do that that often. There's very few situations where you want to do that, which is why balance becomes, you know, an important aspect of being a really good player, right? If I'm always checking the nut flush draw, if I'm always betting the nut flush draw there or my flush draws, when a club comes on the turn or river, he can pull a lot of pressure against me, right? So also, when I do check that flop, if a club does come, and I was like, if he had that, you know, if he has that read on me, then like, now I can get full value because it looks like I'm bluffing because I didn't bet the flop, right? So that's a big misconception I think a lot of people have about some black and white situations where you should either do this or this. It's not that simple. You should do this a lot and you should do this sometimes, okay? So I would say here, you figure it out for yourself, but you know, some percentage of the time, you want to have some checks here, okay? And you also want to bet. So, you know, you have a pretty strong hand with the ace high. But I like to check against Tom Dwan, who's an aggressive player. Again, big part of the reason is to, you know, change the range that he perceives me to potentially have, right? So by checking, I think he probably thinks, which is true, that I would be betting this flop a great deal with flush draw, right? So that this is part of the reason that I'm checking. Again, we're super, super deep. And they're looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm like... He is, but he understands how to make a good show. Oh, you know, hell yeah. yeah. yeah so he plays it up a little on he's TV. He's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. He's fantastic TV. Mm-hmm. Fantastic TV. But by the way, he's a really good dude. It's hard to believe for, mm. for some of my customers, whatever. Hey, 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 they, they're, they're like, are you serious? I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, the guy's a really, really good dude with big heart. Big, big heart. Very generous person. JRB trying to get a Phil Helm with good dude conversation going on. <laughs> and then you see him no on takers. TV berating the player that doesn't even know how to spell poker. I'm like, oh. <laughs> By the way, I think at the end when he's watching, he also says, Juan right. still has the best hand. And his wife is a psychiatrist. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Daniel's picked up a straight draw along with his nut flush draw. You know what? I will have more. Juan bet 17. I wanted my own. We need to get this. I want something a little, little. Something to bring the... Bring the good stuff. It's time for the good stuff. <laughs> says Daniel the good stuff. The good stuff. is going to raise with his big draw. That's pretty good. Let us see if the AJ ace high strategy works. <laughs> two for two so far. $30,000 raise. Juan's just got a pair of eights. He also has an inside straight draw. That's a river. Three for three. How about that? Uh, ah, Daniel would have made the flush. Was my wife's I, took her to I didn't want to see that river. Oh, so nice. I didn't want to see it. Cool. Turn card is the four of hearts. Now I have a gut shot, right? And I also block 5-7, which I can have. I can have the 5-7 of hearts, the, you know, 5-7 of spades, 5-7 five, seven, five, seven of clubs even, I could potentially have. Although I may put a check raise in on the flop with that, specifically. I check into the 23K pot and Duan bets 17,000, okay? So what do you do here? 17 to win 40, okay? 17 to win 40. So you're not quite getting the right price. Right? Unless you think the ace is good and the five is good, I guess. Right? Well, yeah. Actually, you probably are getting pretty close to the right price. I didn't figure it out. But anyway, that wasn't the whole point of this, this the, the way that I played this hand. So as played, when I check call this flop and I check turn, if I ever check raise here with five, seven, with sets, with, you know, aces and all these types of hands, right? Again, I need to have some bluffs, Right? So in this spot, what could be some of my bluffs? 9-10 is a candidate, right? Because, you know, you flop the gut shot. Maybe you check raise, try to hit it. But the, the ace, this, having the 7 in my hand is a lot better than 9-10 because of one key factor. And I block one of the hands, the 5-7 suited, which he could have. I block that hand 
from one of the ones that can re-raise me off my equity on the turn, right? Because one of the worst things you can do is check raise turn with a draw in a spot where the guy like might just stick it in your face and you're like, well, what do I waste all that money for, right? So calling if, if it's the right price, it's barely, I'm, again, I'm not gonna do the math, but it's close, doesn't, you know, it's, it's close enough. If, if you factor in implied odds, probably is okay. I probably would call, you know, if this, like if my only choices were call or fold here, call is the one that I would pick. Um, but again, in this spot, you got to have some bluffs, right? And it's not a terrible idea to use some of the hands that have a decent amount of equity as your bluffs, right? As I said, the seven blocks, seven, five, I have the ace too. So if he just has like king, queen, king, jack, now I've got a decent amount of outs. As I said, a five, an ace, or a club. And again, having that seven, as I said, is important so that you don't get re-raised off the hand at that stack depth. Um, but again, I think the most important aspect of this is uh, understanding in each situation that you have to be perceived by your opponents as having some value here and some bluffs here. And if you're not doing one of the, if you're not bluffing, then it's always value on those check raises. And then what happens is nobody ever calls you unless they have the nuts pretty close to it, right? So I felt like as played, one of the other aspects of it is this. Because I didn't bet the flop, right? Because I didn't bet the flop, less likely in his mind that I have a flush draw. Why? Because I didn't bet the flop. And what do you do on the flop when you have a flush draw? You bet. And I didn't bet. So when I didn't bet, if he's, mis- if he's misconstructing you know, my range in this spot, now all of a sudden eliminating, eliminating all the club combos, what's left for me to be bluffing with? What hand check calls that flop and then is bluffing the turn? Other than one. 9-10 suited. That's it. And not 9-10 of clubs. So the, what does that leave? 9-10 of hearts, 9-10 of spades, 9-10 of times. That's three total combinations of legitimate bluffs. That's it. Versus... Five seven suited, straight pocket, you know pocket whatever you know the sets, pocket aces, maybe some ace king, a whole bunch of hands, right? There's a whole bunch of value, and perceived what perception wise, he probably only thinks there are three natural bluffs, which is the nine ten suiteds, right? Sure, I could turn some bottom pair type hands into a bluff and different things like that, reasonable, but overall, I think I can, I think I can turn this specific whole grouping of flush draws into bluffs because I checked the flop. So I checked the flop, throw them off the scent, right? So now again, like I said, if a computer's, let's say for example, an output, a GTO output says, always bet the flop with the flush draw, right? And the computers knew this. Well, computer would know for a fact that you never have two clubs on the turn, which means there's not enough bluff combos, so it's just going to fold, right? So obviously no computer is going to do that because they do, they hardly do anything like 100% or 0% of the time. Very rare to find something that's a pure bet or pure check. So A7 of clubs, again, a hand with some equity, blocking the 7-5, which is one of the hands that, you know, you, you risk uh, getting um, re-raised off of, you know, if he, if he decides to shut you out of the pot. He probably doesn't have, like, king-king, right? So in terms of his really, really strong hands, let's look at that. Like, he can have pocket eights, he can have pocket sixes. He can obviously, because he's a loosey-goosey player, have kings up too, right? He can have eights and sixes. He can have all those kind of hands. And that's okay. So if he has some of those hands, we are still going to have the nine clubs and, you know, at least the three fives, which gives us 12 outs. Um, you know, again, slightly less if he has two pair and the two pair, you know, the club, he makes him a full. You get what I'm saying. Anyway, interesting spot. Another little check raise bluff against Tom there that got away with it. Uh, I, as far as his bet here, I don't love it. I don't love it. I don't, I don't love betting sort of like the mid part of your range in these spots. I think he can go ahead and uh, I think he probably just doesn't expect to get check raised here. Hardly ever. You know, as played. I think he just thinks it's gonna, he's going to bet and then he can go check check on the river and he can charge me for any sort of draws, right? But you have to be a little bit you know, more careful with that when you're playing against good players who may check raise you, right? So anyway, you want to construct your turn betting range a little bit more with like really strong hands, bluffs, and then the middle stuff maybe, you know, in these spots you, you'd be a little more careful with. I understand why he did bet it. As I said, he probably doesn't expect to get check raised hardly ever here, which is exactly why we done did it and we got away with it. Hope you enjoyed this little sort of two-hand combo versus Tom Dwan. There will be more on the way. High stakes poker exclusively on Poker Go.